Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're very happy to be joined today by Dr. Tommy Rock, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the Geosciences Department at Princeton University. And uh, if you don't know us, Good Energy Collective, we are focused on developing policies for advanced nuclear, but we also really want to grapple with the injustices in nuclear's past and its ongoing legacy. So for uh, the first of our film club series, we wanted to watch um, The Return of Navajo Boy, and we were encouraging people in our network to watch the film, which if you haven't watched it yet, uh, I really encourage you to do. Um, it's easy to find streaming. Um, you can rent it or buy it. And the film is about a lot more than just uranium mining, and we, we really appreciated how it got at sort of the heart of the human impact and the multi-generational impact of the uranium mining industry in the US. So why we invited Dr. Rock today was we wanted to hear a little bit more about the state of uranium contamination in Navajo Nation as it is today, um, and maybe some ideas of what could be done to help address it. So I have a few questions that I'm gonna ask, um, but we also have opened up the Q&A function um, and we encourage people to post questions there. If you have questions um, from the film or um, just for Dr. Rock, um, we can take either. And yeah, I think we're ready to kick it off. So my first question, um, you know, I mostly work with people in the nuclear industry. And I think a lot of people who are involved in nuclear energy uh, naively assume that contamination from mining is a historical issue. It's, you know, a tragedy for sure, but not an ongoing problem in the present. So, um, Dr. Rock, could you give us an overview of kind of the current state of these abandoned mines and milling sites? And what's the public health impact today? Okay. For Navajo Nation, um, we're at the brink of the start of the remediation process. It's gonna start from the eastern part of the reservation and go west. And I suppose it started, started two years ago, but pandemic happened. So everything stopped at the moment. So everything is um, kind of murky because I'm not, not sure where everything is at the moment. Um, I don't know when the regulator is gonna start the process again of, of um, starting the remediation. Um, but so far, from 2007 to now, the present date, there, to my knowledge, there's only been one, one site that has been remediated. It's a temporary cleanup. Um, that is the, the skyline mine. Um, if you've seen the return of Navajo board, the skyline mine is on top and Elsie Maysdale lives on the bottom. And the mine on top, um, there's a little um, cap. It's like, it was like a, the, rem the remediation that was, they done it like a Tupperware. So there's a lining underneath and then they, they put all the mine waste, then they put another lining, put some more coverage on there. And Neville abandoned mine lands, they came in to, make it so that the weatherization won't impact the site specifically. So there's, they did some work around it. So the water will not flow in that area and it will flow around it. So they did that. And um, yeah, so that's the, that's, that happened so far up, up to this point. And in terms of impact, that's still going on with the with the health impact. Um, I don't know how how big of impact it has so far, but I'm doing some work on Skyline specifically, looking at dust. I'm, I'm collecting dust, and I know when they did the remediation process over at Skyline, they left some of the ore um, near the cliff. This, uh, where the skyline is, and it's right at the edge, and the slope of that particular one, that one area, one area is about probably um, maybe sixty to seventy degree slope, really steep. Due to the slope of that area, they didn't do um, 
they didn't collect all the uranium waste because of that. It was just too dangerous. So they left some of that there for safety reason. So now the people that live down below LCB gate and family and the people that live down below, they, they want to know if the uranium dust is coming down when, it, when, when the wind's blowing pretty badly. Um, the wind's been blowing pretty badly for the past couple of days so far, and it's starting, the wind's starting to pick up again. So hopefully I can collect some of that dust, take that out with me and um, analyze that and see how much uranium dust is coming down. If there is, like a, um, what's the toxicity level of that uranium? So I'm gonna go find all of that. But in other places, some of the mine waste, um, they're still there. Um, I seen a lot of uranium ore still out in the open. I see them out in the washes still. Um, for example, at Monument 2, which is over in Cane Valley, one of the biggest uranium mine um, operation that was going on in Arizona. And that site, um, it's about a mile wide, about a mile wide and it has a north wash and a south wash. And both of these washes where the mine was taking place, all the mine waste is at the bottom. So when you go over there, it's like you see these uraninite, um, carnitite, um, um, cofinite, it's like a, um, all present there. So you have all, all these ores that are present. And on top of that, it's, just not, just, it's not just uranium, there's um, um, uranium, there's vanadium still present and there's thorium is present as well. So like the, the ore, so those are still present. And um, so yeah, it's, it's, they are still there. The mine waste are still there. I know it's, it's the same in some of these mine in, in Monument Valley area. Um, also in um, Cove, Red Valley, Red Mesa, Church Rock, um, let's see, um, Cameron Air, still like that. It's where the mine took uh, took place, or where the where the mining was happening. You can see a lot of these mine wastes that are still present. So there's there's a lot of abandoned mines and a lot of mining waste. For those of us who aren't scientists, you've mentioned the dust, and I know a lot of your research has been about water quality testing. Um, can you kind of give us a, a layperson explanation of how uranium or these other ores gets from the mines into the environment and really into, into people and livestock? Like what's that pathway? How does it become a, a public health problem? It becomes a problem. Uranium can be transported by water and be carried, carried on, carried off by dust as well. So it's very subject to, to weatherization. And with um, one of the things that I've worked on in Sanders, Arizona, Sanders, Arizona is a location where there's no uranium mine that has happened. And all the mine activities further up soon about, about 80 miles um, northeast of, of Sanders. And there's like uranium mining, um, uranium milling, then the spill that happened back in 1979. So with all of that happening and the mining operation stopped back in 1986 in Church Rock. So when we did the work uh, back in 2015, um, we saw the groundwater contamination. Because of the geology, how, um, how, that, is, how that is in that area, it took um, that from 1979 to 2015 to see um, groundwater contamination there. But looking at the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality data, mm -hmm. um, Chris Shuey um, got into their database and looked at some of the water quality that they have. We found that in 2003, there was uranium present in the public water in, in 2003 and from 2003 to 2015 like uh, they didn't sample every year they sample every other year up to like 2009 i think 2003 2009 i think there's a big gap there and then from 2009 
onward to 2015, you see that um, uranium in the water every year that they sample there. So when we did the um, work there, we don't know when it started because um, there's, there's like a, from 2003 to 1988, I think, there's a big gap. Um, I know that there is a um, graduate student from UNLV that did work over there and another person from USGS out of Flagstaff did some work there as well, but they did not test the public water though. They only sampled um, the unregulated water sources that were that was um, present there in the Perkin River Valley area. We did the public water and we also sampled some unregulated water sources and we found that there's a groundwater contamination. And so pretty that's high how, levels, right? Yeah, it's pretty elevated um, in the in the water over in the Sanders area. Um, so with one of the ways that urine gets in the human human body um, nowadays is like through drinking water, it's like water contamination, and the other is thus another is um, by eating something that's um, that has been exposed. We did some work looking at livestock, looking at different tissues, and we've seen that some of the she, um, sheep stomach, the stomach lining has like a uranium in, in the stomach tissue. And anytime you're doing work with uranium, like with water, water sampling, you usually add um, a little bit of nitric acid to preserve it so, so um, it doesn't dilute. So it still, still, it still stays there. So when the sheep eats, um, um, shrubs, especially during the winter when there is a lack of vegetation, they will eat the dust and the root. Like they, they'll eat the whole thing. And by doing that, they'll consume some of that uranium and that will accumulate the stomach. And I think that's, that's the reason why we've seen um, uranium in the stomach. And we've seen some um, in the kidneys and liver as well. Um, yeah, so I know that research is still ongoing. It, yeah, it uh, kind of concentrates everywhere um, when you have animals eating as well. Um, so shifting a little bit to the present, there I know there's been some momentum in recent years, especially during the Trump administration and now because of potential sanctions on Russian uranium to try and increase uranium mining in the US. And I know you gave testimony before the US House Committee on Natural Resources in 2019, and you were very clear that you oppose any new uranium mining. Um, and I completely respect that. And, but I was thinking, you know, if there is a community in the US um, that might be interested in hosting new uranium mining activity, what advice would you give them for requirements they should have, sort of um, best practices, standards? What should they be demanding before they allow new mining on, on their land or in their communities? How to sort of minimize impacts on the environment and public health for, for new mining? First of all, I'd rather see them make a law or a policy around uranium mine cleanup. So far, there's none. The only thing that they have um, related to uranium mining is the uranium male tailing radi radiation compensation at um, Umtruka. Uranium male tailing radiation compensation, yeah, um, Umtruka. And that's specifically for uranium males, the former uranium males. There's about 24 of them across the US, um, to my knowledge. And all of those sites are super fun sites at the moment. And there's none related to, to, um, to uranium mining. I'm sorry, it's just threw me off with you. <laughs> so, but yeah, there's none at the moment um, related to um, former uranium mines. And on Navajo Nation, there's um, about over 12,000 abandoned uranium mine. And when they're dealing with uranium mining, they, they 
I mean, the federal regulators and regulators, like they reframe the issue. They combine a lot of these minds that are near each other and count it as one. So for Navajo Nation, it came down to 524 abandoned minimums. Excuse me. I'm oh, sorry. Um, but some of the work that I'm doing, I see some many mines over in Beirut as well, abandoned many mines. And those mines, the entrance are still open. Anybody can go in. I see mine ways out um, at the entrance as well, like Bears Ears, Fry King. I see that. And there's no signs, there's no warning to the public about the dangers that they're in, uh, being exposed themselves to uh, uranium or radiation. Um, and looking at the BLM web website, I don't see any warning related to uh, being exposed to uranium. I do see warning related to the dangers of these um, abandoned mines. I do see that, but nothing related to people being exposed to the uranium or the radiation that, that spreads up there. Again, more about like falling in um, or the the mine collapse. Yeah. You know? But yeah, again, it's like um, as I mentioned before, it's like these, it's not only uranium, it's like a combination of, of um, metals that are present, as I mentioned before, vanadium, uranium, and thorium as well. Well, that, that gets at my next question, which is something that really surprised me um, reading about this issue, particularly I know a lot of us on, on this webinar have read Yellow Dirt by Judy Pasternak. Um, something that surprised me was that the US government doesn't even know exactly how many abandoned uranium mines there are in this region. So I've, I've seen numbers like there's a thousand abandoned mines at like 520 mine groups, um, but there's probably a lot more than we don't know the locations or we don't know where they all are. So do you think there's a need to fund some sort of more comprehensive study to locate all these mines or should there be a focus more on just getting more resources to clean up the mines that we do know about? Like, do we know about the worst offenders and we should, you know, close, make sure people don't get near these sites? Um, or is there also work to just identify the locations of more of these abandoned mines? Um, there's, I've seen um, reports saying there's about 15,000 abandoned uranium mines. And a lot of these mines are near um, tribal reservations. And uh, going back to your previous question as well, a lot of these abandoned uranium mines are not being addressed. There's no discussion, there's no dialogue. Um, at the federal level, like in DC, no politicians talking about that. I think there needs to be a conversation of, of these abandoned mines that are not being addressed and should be addressed before we are talking about the possibility of new uranium mining. Yeah. Um, well, that gets at my at my next question, which is a, a big one, and you you've touched on some of these points. So the the Biden Harris administration um, has placed a renewed focus on environmental justice, um, and particularly with respect to climate change, but you know all sorts of um, legacy issues and and historical issues. So with respect to remediation of contamination in Navajo Nation. A kind of big picture question, but what would real justice look like? Like, what sorts of resources are needed? Are there new laws that are needed in terms of um, cleanup? Um, what are sort of the big gaps, or is it just not much has been done? There needs to be a, a lot more done. I think there needs to be a lot more done, especially when it comes to indigenous populations. Um, I know Navajo Navajo Nation is a big tribe, and we're getting response from from the federal government about um, some of these um, pathway disclosures. Um, and I think that other tribes um, need that so they can better understand the pathway of exposure, um, such as 
for Navajo Nation, we look at some, some of the traditional food and we look at some of the grass grasses that are grown near the abandoned mine. We've seen that some of those um, grasses do have like an uptake of these um, uraniums. Um, and um, there needs to be more work done related to other plants that uh, animals eat and also plants that we use for medicine and ceremony, um, ceremony as well. So, so there's still a big gap that we don't fully understand in terms of pathway exposure um, and looking at the food web as, as well. So sheep is this one animal that we, we do eat and there are other animals that we do, that we do eat as well. Okay, uh, sounds like a lot of work, <laughs> um, unfortunately, but um, good to get uh, the conversation started. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, I just put a um, website that sh that talks about the abandoned uranium mines. Um, it's abandonedmines.gov, and sp specifically talking about the abandoned mines. There was another uh, report that was done by USCPA back in 2013, 2014. Um, I, I can't find that report. I know I have it somewhere, but I can't find that report at the moment. But um, this is another report that was done by the US government, particularly looking at the, the abandoned mines, abandoned uranium mines. And that does mention that there are about 15,000 um, abandoned uranium mines in the US. Um, wait, well, if you find that later and want to send it to us, we can share it, um, with those who attended or, um, other places, um, on our, in our network. Um, so I'd love to see that. So we've been getting some good questions. Um, so I'm going to ask a few of them. Um, the first one comes from Ben. Um, it's a little technical, but I, I think you can answer it. So the question is, is the, um, chemical toxicity or radiotoxicity a larger risk to human health? So I know uranium, you know, it's, it's radioactive, but it's also a heavy metal. Um, so his question is, do the remediation techniques vary accordingly, or is it just about keeping the uranium contained no matter what? I would say keeping the uranium contained in terms of toxicity of, of uranium like as a heavy metal and uh, as a radionuclide. It all depends on how, what the levels are, um, meaning that um, some of the uranium ore, um, I see them go up as high as 36 parts per million. Um, and I see the radiation level about the same level as well, 36 microsievert. Um, and so yeah, it's like um, it all depends on on how how much they're give, giving off and how much um, heavy metal is present. But as a whole, I think just keeping them contained is 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 better um, rather than trying to address um, trying to address both of them or one of them. But um, okay. as a as um. Um, that some of the stuff that I've seen in Frank Canyon, looking at Happy Valley, I didn't go on top of um, where the mine was operating. I just stayed down below um, where where people go and go off off roading. There's like a, a sign that says um, you can use your off road vehicles like four track, dirt bike, um, and what have you. And looking at some of the washes. There, I seen um, thorium level above background. Um, you, for Fry Canyon, the thorium level was like around one, about one parts per million, I believe it was. Um, but some of the areas that I've seen, it goes up to like um, 30, 40, or 50. So for cleanup levels, I, think, I believe that's like um, five for thorium, I think it was, and uranium. Background level for that area was I seen them at um, anywhere from 12 to um, 20, 20 parts per million. 
my egg can go up high as, a, as 30 parts per million. So anything below 30 parts per million is like, um, usually considered um, um, more, more, more elevated than back room level. And I do see some of that um, levels higher, higher than that. Um, another good question from Ben, a little bit different, is um, what collaboration or does any collaboration exist between U.S. and Canadian Indigenous groups that have been impacted by uranium mining? I know the history is different in, in both um, regions, but are there sort of sharing of remediation practices or? Not to my knowledge, maybe there is. Um, I'm not too sure. Um... Maybe with my with my tribe with Navajo abandoned mine lands, they may um, share information with other tribes. But um, I'm not too sure about Canada. Um, maybe tribes such as the Spokane, Washington, uh, mm. Spokane tribes up in the state of Washington. Um, maybe they're they're near the Canadian border. There's been quite a bit of. of Uranium mining activity in the past there, and they're doing some remediation. I don't know where they're at. Maybe with that tribe and the Canadian tribe, maybe, but for us, um, not to my knowledge. Maybe there has been in the past. I just haven't heard, heard about it yet. I think we can look into. And um, Ron Jester has a question. He asks, do you think that in situ leaching would be a safer way to mine uranium. I don't think that's safer. <laughs> Even though you don't see it, that doesn't mean it's safe. Uh, the part, I'm really concerned about that type of mining because it has to do with- Can you with, explain um, what that is? Sorry, for people that don't know. Oh, it's what like- What is um, in situ? <laughs> it's the- they put some um, chemicals or acid and shoot it, shoot it down where the ore is at, and then they suck it back out. And okay. there's like a water mon monitoring all the way around so they can contain the kind of groundwater contamination if it happens. But my concern there is like, um, there are some areas that have faults and then also, um, we're not really sure how the ge geological layers are there. And I think that that's a, it's a greater risk for groundwater contamination. And, um, and to, to my knowledge, I haven't heard any groundwater, groundwater contamination that have been cleaned up. If there is, let me know because um, I tried looking for any groundwater contamination that's been cleaned up. I haven't seen it, but if you do, let me know. Um, but yeah, that's that's a big risk um, in, in my opinion. Also, living in the southwest, um, we we don't have a lot of water, um, so stuff like in situ. Institute uh, leaching type mining or institute uh, type mining is, 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 a, is a big concern um, just because of lack of, of good water. Good water is hard to come by. Yeah, um, that gets to the next question. Um, I don't know, Ariel, do you, can we have you ask this question live? Jackie, can you? Yes, Ariel. Second. Sorry, I could have been doing that for more questions, and, but. No worries. Hi, Dr. Rock, so nice to have you. So I had a question for you. What would be the best way to remediate groundwater and surface water that's contaminated by uranium? And in that case, would the water ever go back to the way it was pre-contamination or is it kind of scarred for life? It will be scarred for life, it's like, um... Um, it's, uh, what do you call that? There's a term for it, it's like, um, um, it's like, um, I wish I had something to, to draw on and write on, let's see. Um, it's like a cost, cost, uh, cost, 
what's it called? Cost analysis or forget what it's called. Anyways, like um, if I I wish I had a marker with me so I could draw on that or write on that. But um, it won't get. It can you can come close to it, but the more you come close to getting that cleanup, it'll cost a lot more money. So there comes a point where it's like um, you have to accept that it won't come to where it was again prior to um, 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 groundwater contamination. And what was it? let's see, I saw the question, so. Is that why it seems like a lot of the um, effort to help in these regions is about providing drinking water or water for livestock, but it's, it's brought in from outside. Yeah, there's a there's one that I think it's it comes close to it. It's um, what's it called? It's uh, my mind's going to blank right now. <laughs> um, reverse osmosis is what I'm thinking about. Getting rid of the uranium in, in the water. Um, but that's very expensive though. So. Um, I don't know if that has been tried. Uh, I'm, I'm not too sure in terms of um, trying to get the water back to the way it was before, but uh, um, I, I'm, I'm not too sure about that. But yeah, probably that expensive on a large that, scale. That might be, yeah. Um, so there was a question from Shannon Anderson. I don't know, Shannon, if you want to ask it live, um, we can give you permissions. Oh, she doesn't have a mic. Okay, um, that is fine. Um, I will ask her a question. So um, Shannon says, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Rock. In the film, uh, The Return of Navajo Boy, it's mentioned that the workers in the mine were not informed of the risks associated with their job. Do you think it's possible for uranium mine workers to be ethically informed of the risk, especially in locations where there may not be opportunities for work outside of mining? So areas that are very dependent on mining for employment. Um, this kind of gets it to my question earlier. Is there a way to do this right? Um, I, I, uh, to answer the question, um, I think there is a way to do it right. It's like I'm informing the community of the risks involved and also um, maybe possibly showing um, what their remuneration would look like um, and for their area, for their environment. Um, because the environment, is, the environment is not going to be the same. The air that's been mined and remediated will be um, capped and there will be signs and no one can't use the area for, for this generation again, the next generation again, for a couple of generations really. And so that's, if they, accept that risk then, and if it's the community agrees with it, then that'll be their, their decision. So I think ethically, as long as they consent, I believe it's like, um, it'll be their choice and their choice to make. That makes sense. Um, there's a follow-up question from uh, Coulter. Sure, I don't know, Coulter, if you want to ask it live. Um... Hi, um, thank you for being here as well. I'm, I'm really happy that we uh, that you get the chance to do this. Um, I just had a bit of a follow-up question on um, that conversation about like whether or not there's a way to do this right. Um, you know, it seems like based on the history of kind of all these injustices with uranium mining, is, is there any desire to do it right? Like, is like, is it kind of one of those things that like, obviously there's incentive from uranium mining companies to go in and do it, but 
um, like, is there any desire from, from native tribes? I know it's obviously can't speak on behalf of all of them, but, um, but is, is there any sort of desire there? To have nope, more mining? No desire. No, no desire there. I know for, for my tribe and Eastern Agency, um, they did have a battle there where, um, one of the former mining company, uh, that was interested in doing uh, in situ mining. The company is based out of Texas. They changed their name from Hydro Incorporated to something else now. And they talked to some of the community from Eastern side to, to do the uranium mining just because of um, socioeconomic reasons like employment and all. But the grassroots organization beat them back and, and told them, um, it's not worth it in the long run, especially with the possibility of groundwater contamination. And other tribes, no, they're not. They're not in favor of that because of what has happened in the past. And again, since since my tribe is big, so it's a big political force, and that's um, I think one of the reasons why. And also, the help of Return of Nevo, but that really put a spot on spot on the pass the money money to be on my reservation, but I do know there are other reservations that have been impacted by UN money and there's no discussion or dialogue whatsoever in terms of remediation as well as like, you know, like um, in Wyoming, the Wind River tribe, there's some UN money um, there, the south of um, the Wind River reservation. Um, and also, North and South Dakota with the Great Soup Nation. Um, yeah, there's a lot more mines, and a lot of those mines have not been mapped out yet. So, so for for tribes to say yes will be um, surprising. But majority of the people that I've talked to, the people that I've known, is like there's no desire for new UN mining on tribal tribal nation. To, to my knowledge. That makes sense. Good to hear. I think um, Jackie has a question she's going to ask. Yeah, Dr. Rob, thanks again for, for everything you're, you're doing and, and sharing with us. Um, you mentioned Elsie Begay's, uh, Elsie May Begay's name earlier and the family portrayed in The Return of Navajo Boy. Do you get to speak with them occasionally? How's the family doing? Yes, I do speak with them occasionally. Like with some of the work that I'm doing with um, collecting dust, I go over there and talk to them about what I'm doing. So um, I think uh, maybe tomorrow or next week, I'll go and talk to, to Elsie again. And yeah, I, 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 I still talk to her. And so far she's doing pretty good. Um, her ex-husband is um, needs help right now. So one of Elsie's daughters helping his father um, to, to get around and do things. <sighs> okay, are there any more questions? I was like, um, since all of you, uh, seems like you've seen the return of Neville board, what do you think of the movie Return of Navajo Boy? Well, I'll, I can't speak for everyone, but I found it very moving and um, gave me a lot to think about, a lot I didn't know about the area and the impacts um, of uranium mining, particularly, you know, how they, how they manifest in, over many generations, um, not just the, the miners themselves who were impacted, um, that really struck me. I don't know if anyone else has comments on the film um, that they wanna share. Oh, that's a good question. Okay, if any, no one else has, does anyone else have comments on the film? Also, is like a, also the other thing is um, we're talking about uranium and some of the stuff that 
I'm working on. I was using an XRF. XRF is like a um, uh, equipment used to do like soil analysis really fast and samples heavy metal. And one of the one of the heavy metal that I'm seeing was um, cesium, cesium-133. Um, mm -hmm. They range from 100 to over 200 parts per million in some, some areas um, to do a, um, I think that's an area of interest that um, I want to go and investigate that a little further. Um, I don't know if it has something to do with the uh, past um, nuclear testing that happened in, the, in Nevada, because um, where we are is right in the path of um, the downwind, downwinders. So I don't know if that's season 137. And season 137 usually relates to um, um, nuclear power plants or, or a nuclear explosion. So. So, so I have a lot more questions and some more to look into as well. So, but I, but I do know that season 133 that, that I've seen. Oh, interesting, yeah. And, Wonder if that's from weapons testing. Yeah. And looking at the, um, the background level for as globally, um, season 133, the background level is three, three parts per million. But for the, Colorado Plateau, I'm not sure yet. So there's still some work I need to do and find out what um, natural background that four season will be. Then I can determine if it's an elevator or not, or if it's just natural. Hmm. But yeah, I don't to, think it should be that high though. Yeah, it sounds high. Um, so I, for people that haven't yet watched the film, I encourage people to watch it. I was going to ask um, you if there's, if people are interested in learning more and diving deeper into this topic, are there other documentaries you'd recommend or books that people should read? I know a lot of us read Yellow Dirt um, by Judy Pasternak, which I mentioned. Are there other things you'd recommend if people want to learn more? Um, there's a book by Peter, Peter Stott, I think was his name. He wrote a book called um, was it when they poison us? I think it's called when they poison us, mm -hmm. or if they poison us. Yeah, it's like, let me see. Let me see if I get that book right. You had a hand raised from Khalil Ryan. I do see. He wants to pose a question. Uh, hi, talk, uh, Dr. Rock. I was actually, I really enjoyed watching the movie. The uh, reunification of John Wayne Cly and his family was actually really emotional. And I liked how they embraced him and then they talked about their traditions and it feels like they really welcomed him back into the family despite him being gone for over 40 years. And that yeah. it was just felt really good to watch, you know, despite him like being taken away from his family at the loss of his mother to like uranium poisoning. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's uh, another topic that um, hasn't been discussed, but it was shown of what happened um, with Native kids that they were lied to that um, that they passed, and in returns that they were um, they were adopted by white families while the families mourn their loss. Um, so that's another topic that's that's very uh, controversial. I did put the name of the book up. It's called "If You Poison Us: Uranium and Native Americans." Um, Uranium and Native Americans by by Peter H. Stoltz. I hope I said his name right. The this book, um, the author interviewed my grandfather. My late grandfather's name is Sean Holiday, so um, you will read about his testimony if you um, read this book. And I do see a question by Ben. Um, with coal mining, it it did um, quite it did impact the Neville Aquifer quite a bit, 
it impacted the both trap Nebo and Hopi and the natural springs and a lot of the springs, a lot of the natural spring that people used to go to are not running no more because the Nebo aquifer have been draining quite a bit. Um, in some areas, you do see some soil that has dropped, um, or land that has dropped. You can see a lot of um, rocks that, that are cracked and kind of like sunk in a bit. You see a lot of that. Um, with the fly ash, um, I know there's been talk about um, people wanted to do some work related to that. Work related to that. That is over in Page, Arizona. So that's a possibility of another another super fun site there over in Page, Arizona, where the uh, the the power plant used to be. So so I do hear hear about that. Um, let's see. Okay. And right now yeah. there's um, people, like the community, especially um, the, the eastern part of the reservation, there's been talk about helium, helium um, mining, or people or companies coming in for helium. And people are concerned about uh, the environmental impact it will have. So, so a lot of the grassroots organizations are gearing up to to battle that out as well, um, not only with the company but with the uh, with our tribal government as well. And I haven't looked at that, so I don't know what the environmental impact is at the moment. But um, people are concerned about that as well. So that's that's beginning to happen, and that's beginning to pick up speed. I've heard about lithium mining too, maybe in the in the Grand Canyon area, or maybe I'm thinking of more in Nevada, but I don't know if that's different. Um, I heard about that in Nevada. I don't know about Grand Canyon. Maybe, okay. I don't know, maybe, maybe it's happening in Grand Canyon as well, but I heard about that in Nevada. And um, I know that the Paiute and Shoshone tribe, I believe, or um, they have concern about that. And I don't know if they're fighting that or not, but I know there's some controversy related to that as well. But right now I'm doing some work around oil and gas, oil and gas field as well. So it's like um, I've seen some of the air, some poor air quality. So there's still a lot more work needs to be done in the area to help adjust the air quality and make that um, more, um, more, more making the air quality um, better or improve that for a better quality of life. I do talk to people and people talk to me about the respiratory issues and um, concern about running and when during the cold, when there's an inversion. So, so there's, there's people that are concerned about and they don't know what type of um, impact the child that group in that environment will have as well. So, so a lot more work to be done. <laughs> lots of, yeah, lots of environmental impacts and public health impacts to be monitoring. That's a, a lot. Um, well, I think if we don't have any more questions, I wanna one more time say thank you so much for joining us and answering all these questions. It was really enlightening. Um, learned a lot, but also have a, a lot more learning to do and a lot more research to do on this topic. So um, I'm going to read that book you recommended. And uh, yeah, we'll keep following your work. Um, looking forward to seeing what you find about cesium. Um, and uh, hopefully it's it's not too high, um, but interesting to, oh. to monitor. Oh, I, I forgot to mention, it's not thorium that's five five parts per million. It's radium. Radium. Oh, okay. The cleanup level for radium is five five parts five per five parts per million, not thorium. So, in a lot of these, um, where you see uranium, um, you see um, vanadium, uranium, thorium, and radium. Radium. I forgot about radium. So, I seen some of the radium level elevated as well. Um, also thorium as well. 
So that's that's uh, pretty concerning. Um, yeah, I know radium has so, pretty yeah, like, make, make serious that. impacts. Yes. On health. Okay, that's not good. Uh, Okay, well, <laughs> um, thank you again. Thank you to everyone who attended and your great questions. We did record this um, for, for um, folks in our network who couldn't tune in today. Um, we'll get to see this great conversation as well. Um, and oh, do we have anything else? Oh, no, people just saying thank you. Um, well, thank you and, and have a great day.